Okay, so this is um, the lecture for chapter 22, which is animal nutrition and digestion. So it's kind of like an anatomy and physiology class. Um, this and the next chapter will be a little bit of an anatomy and physiology unit. So let's talk about um, nutrition and digestion. Really, it's going to talk about the digestive system. Um, so the first thing we have here is we're going to have different kinds of diets that exist. So you guys are probably all familiar with these words. Um, if you are an herbivore, um, that means you feed on plants or algae. So you're going to um, subsist on photosynthetic organisms of the world. So you can see this bird. The parrot here is an herbivore. Um, some animals are carnivores, and so they only eat other animals. Um, and so you can see a picture of a carnivore here. And then we have uh, omnivores, which are some animals eat both plants and animals, um, which, you know, I'm an omnivore. I'll eat both plants and animals. Um, and so you want to know those definitions. Some terminology for um, the digestive system. Ingestion, digestion, absorption, and elimination. So here's our food. We ingest the food, and then we digest the food. So what is the difference between ingesting and digesting, right? Ingestion is simply putting it in your mouth and swallowing it. So if you think about it, we can ingest anything. If you had a little um, Lego toy, right? Kids will sometimes swallow things that they shouldn't swallow. So they can ingest um, anything that would fit down your esophagus, really. But does it get digested? So that brings us to digestion. Digestion is the breakdown of what you took in. So you can do that two ways. You can mechanically break it down, which is basically just crumbling it up or chewing it up and breaking a big thing, right, a big particle into smaller particles. So mechanically, we do that by chewing. Okay, so we chew our food, mechanically digesting it into smaller chunks. And then the really nitty gritty digestion takes place with chemicals. So inside our body, we make these um, enzymes, we know what enzymes are, and enzymes are going to chemically cleave um, the units of the thing. So say a protein will get chemically digested into amino acids or carbohydrates, right? A long polysaccharide will get digested chemically into monosaccharides. So enzymes do the bulk of our chemical digestion. When those smaller molecules are in our digestive tract, then they are absorbed. And what that means is that they physically go through the membranes of our cells and enter into the cells. So think about the only way that we can use these molecules, right, is that if they are absorbed, because we are a collection of cells and our cells require those molecules to come inside. So we can't, uh, if, if a molecule is just floating around in our bloodstream or if it's just floating around in the middle of our um, intestines, it's not useful, right? It's not being used, it's just kind of out, out there. Um, but it needs to be taken in, into the cell in order for it to get used. So absorption is moving it into the cells and then we eliminate what we don't use. So undigested materials are eliminated. And those are the four basic steps of our uh, digestive system, right? What um, our digestive tract does. So here's an example of digestion, right? So we have a cheese pizza, really tasty cheese pizza. We have cheese proteins and proteins are a long chain of amino acids. So we're breaking them down, in this example, we're breaking them down enzymatically, right? So we have amino acids being produced. Those amino acids are absorbed into the cells. And then through the bloodstream, they can go to other cells, okay? But they don't, they need to be inside of a cell in order to be used. Those amino acids can be used to make different kinds of proteins, because remember, we don't need to make cheese proteins, but we need to make our own human proteins. And, but the building blocks are the same. So we can just use these building blocks, arrange them in different ways. And there we have our, our human protein. So what's our concept check here? Saliva contains an enzyme that breaks down large polysaccharides into monosaccharides. This is an example of, so you should have chosen answer B, right? It's a chemical digestion with enzymes. 
how do animals digest their food without digesting themselves? So if we have, uh, if we think about it, right, the digestion process is pretty nasty. We have chemicals that break down other larger chemicals. And how is it that our, our stomach and our intestines don't get digested at the same time that we're digesting the food? And it's because we have very specialized compartments that do the digesting. So different kinds of animals on the planet have different kinds of comp these compartmentalization. So if you look at Roman numeral three for digestion cavities, um, letter A is food vacuoles. So this is kind of in simple sponges. In simple sponges, right, remember sponges from the last chapter, they have specialized amoeba sites that take in food via phagocytosis. And then inside of those cells, those amoeba sites, they are going to create a food vacuole. So it's going to have a small um, vacuole, right? Kind of like a, a vesicle with a phospholipid membrane. And then they're going to fuse with lysosomes. Remember, lysosomes are those small, tiny vesicles with acid and with enzymes inside. And then the food is digested, but it's only going to get digested inside that vacuole membrane. All right. So as the food is digested, the smaller food molecules can exit the vacuole membrane into the cytoplasm and nourishes the cell. So all that nasty acid and chemical, the enzymes, they stay inside the vacuole membrane. So the cytoplasm and the organelles are not harmed. So this is a reminder of that image, right? We have the amoeba site here. This is a, a specialized cell as well. Um, we didn't talk about this one, but the flagellated cell brings the water in and there's our amoeba site taking the food. So you see how the food that's in orange is packaged up in a little circle unit. That would be the food vacuole. And digestion would take place inside that food vacuole. So the cytoplasm remains unharmed. All right, then we have letter B and letter C, a gastrovascular cavity versus an alimentary canal, otherwise known as a digestive tract. So what's the difference? A gastrovascular cavity is just one cavity with one opening. Okay, so it's an, the in is also the out. So in organisms like this hydra, this is where the prey comes in, it gets digested, and all the undigested weight comes out, waste comes out. The alimentary canal or digestive tract has two openings. So this is familiar to us, right, because we have a complete tract. One opening serves to take in the food. That's going to be called the mouth. The food will travel through the digestive tract in one direction, and then all the waste comes out the other side, or the anus. Okay, So all along the path of the alimentary canal is specialized to break down the nutrients, um, but in a way that doesn't harm the cells of the body and absorb those nutrients as well. Okay, same thing here, right? The breakdown, the lining here is going to be shielded from the enzymes, protected, um, and also be able to absorb. So there's specialized cells here that di engulf the absorbed uh, nutrients or engulf the, the nutrients that have been broken down. All right, so that's the big difference, right? The big difference is that gastrovascular cavities have one opening, one central cavity, in and out the same way. Elementary canals have two separate openings, and there's a one-way path through that. So what does a sponge have as their digesting cavities? And the answer is A, they have food vacuoles. All right, so we're going to begin now with looking at the human digestive tract. Um, so this is your sort of intro anatomy physiology lection, lecture, um, and so we're going to start with the mouth. So the mouth is obviously for ingesting food. Ingestion takes place at the mouth. This is also where we have mechanical digestion ha occurring with chewing. And there's also chemical digestion going on. So number three, there are enzymes inside of your saliva called salivary amylase and it digests starch into simple sugar. So remember starch is a polysaccharide. It's a really big molecule, and you're beginning to break it down immediately in the mouth. Now I'm gonna add here, there's an, another enzyme uh, in your saliva called lipase, L-I-P-A-S-E. So lipase also breaks down fats. So you have two food groups that immediately get broken down chemically in your mouth, which is your starches 
and your fats with amylase and lipase. The tongue is geared to taste, right? The taste is also really, really important for, um, your sense of smell is also really important for your sense of taste. Um, if you have been sick recently and you lost your sense of smell, your nose is clogged up, food doesn't taste good anymore, it just tastes pretty bland, and that's because your sense of smell really informs your sense of taste. And then your, your tongue and uh, all the muscles of your mouth will move the food around as you chew it, mix it with saliva, and then shape it into a ball uh, to swallow it. Oops. So here's your mouth for ingestion, for digestion, and for taste. I want to um, point out that those bumps on your tongue, those are called papillae. They are not taste buds. Taste buds are actually inside grooves of those bumps that you can see, and taste buds are microscopic, so you can't see them. Um, and they're the ones that can detect the chemicals in the food. All right, so swallowing. So let's take a look at letter B, the pharynx. Um, actually, let me go back up and just show you where the pharynx is on a still picture. So the pharynx is here. It is what we would call the throat. Um, it's a common pathway at the very back of our mouth. It's the very, it actually starts in the back of our nose, comes down the back of our mouth, and then comes a little bit further down beyond our tongue. But this area back here is called the pharynx. And this is a, a general pathway for both food and also for air when we breathe. So let's take a look at um, how we can stop choking because if you imagine the food coming into your mouth, because we have this common passageway in the back here, food can actually go up into your nasal cavity, right? Because there's a common hallway, basically a pathway. So food is able to come out your nose, and sometimes we've had that experience ourselves where maybe you uh, are laughing in the middle of swallowing or you happen to sneeze or, or choke or something happens suddenly um, and you get food in your nasal cavity. That's because the pharynx connects the two. And then also you wanna route the food down your esophagus and not through your trachea. So your windpipe or your trachea also sits right here so there's a little split right here. So when you swallow food, the food can either go down your windpipe or your trachea or down the esophagus. And of course you want it to go down the esophagus. So there's a little mechanism here that ensures that the food goes correct in the correct way. So let's look at that. So under letter B for swallowing, it's a reflex. And there's two things listed here. Letter A, the soft palate. So I'm gonna point that out to you. You see this area? So this whole area is the roof of your mouth, right? The technical word for that is called the palate. The hard palate is the part of your, the roof of your mouth that has bone. So it's, it's hard because it has the bone reinforcing it. But then the bone disappears and the rest of your sort of roof of your mouth is very soft. That's called the soft palate. The soft palate is pushed up by the tongue. Notice when he swallows, the tongue kind of comes up further and it pushes the soft palate so it closes off this entire pathway into the nasal cavity. Okay, so that's one reflex action that stops food from coming into the nose is the soft palate closes off this region because the tongue pushes it. Now let's look down here. So now we can see two pathways, right? So this anterior pathway, the one in front, is the trachea or your windpipe, and this is the esophagus that's smaller. Okay, so when you swallow, we wanna make sure the food goes down the back past the esophagus and not the front. So you see this little flap this little flap is going to come down. Every time this animation swallows, the flap is pushed down so it closes off the entranceway into the windpipe and only allows the food to go backwards into the esophagus, right? So that's called the epiglottis, letter B. This flap that I'm talking about is the epiglottis and it is pushed up. So if you've never, ever noticed when people swallow, their Adam's apple goes up and down. Okay, so when, the whole reason be, why it goes up is when it goes up, it pushes this guy down, okay? So you have to have muscles that move your Adam's apple or your larynx up. It pushes the epiglottis down. Therefore, the food is routed into the esophagus and not into your trachea. So what happens if food goes in to your trachea, right? We have the cough reflex. So when anything touches this area here, you have a reflex mechanism in place that coughs, so that sudden 
push of air from your lungs, which is what a cough is, right? It would help to dislodge the food that's stuck here. And if that's not enough, right, and maybe the food completely obscures this path and you can't take a breath in or out, then you're gonna need the Heimlich maneuver. And the Heimlich maneuver is uh, someone coming to you and pushing your diaphragm so forcefully and suddenly that the air is pushed out of your lungs so forcefully that it would dislodge any food that's in there that would be stuck in this area. So that's called the Heimlich maneuver. So this is a, a still picture of what you were seeing, right? So there's your epiglottis. Here's our pharynx. This is the windpipe or the trachea. Here's your esophagus. And so when you swallow, your Adam's apple, which is part of your larynx, goes up, the epiglottis comes down, and the food travels down your esophagus because it's closed off from the trachea. All right, so now that we um, have food in our esophagus, let's talk about the esophagus. So letter C. The esophagus is a muscular tube, so it's, it's a kind of muscle called smooth muscle. It's a um, kind of muscle you can't control. There's actually three different muscle types in your body. There's the muscle that you can control that's in your arms and legs. And then there's the muscle that's in your organs, um, and you can't control that. That's called smooth, and so your esophagus is this kind of muscle that you can't control. And what the smooth muscle does is it contracts rhythmically. That rhythmic contraction is called peristalsis, which is um, the bolded word in number two of your outline. So peristalsis will push the food through your digestive tract, starting at the esophagus all the way down until the very end. Um, and it's very powerful. So if, even if you're hanging upside down, you could still swallow food and the food would still get to your stomach because the smooth muscle contractions are strong. So peristalsis will push the food all the way down into your stomach, and your stomach is a bag-like organ, okay, and it's shaped a little bit like the letter J, and it's stored there for several hours. It can churn the food. Churning just means to mix it up, and then after the stomach has mixed it up with the stomach acids, it's called chyme, and um, chyme, you can think of it just kind of like a, a soup, right? After your stomach is done with it, it's, it's basically soup or you know, I'm sure everybody here has thrown up in their life. It's, it's that, you know, so after your stomach has sort of digested the food partially. So what does gastric juice contain? So gastric juice contains um, three uh, proponent components. Uh, it has very strong hydrochloric acid. So the acid helps to break down molecules well as well. So it's another form of chemical digestion. Uh, it has enzymes that is only going to digest protein. And the enzyme here is called pepsin. So pepsin breaks down proteins in the stomach. And then mucus. So mucus is really important that, um, in the stomach because the wall of the stomach needs to be protected by that thick layer of mucus. Um, because the hydrochloric acid is so acidic, it would burn the wall of the stomach. But since we have that mucus there, it does not touch the stomach wall, so you don't get burned. Okay, and so this picture shows you the junction of the esophagus into the stomach. And you see how the wall of the stomach, this is another area of smooth muscle, it's gonna squish um, and squeeze the food and then help to mix the food with the gastric juice and form chyme. So let me show you the number four where it says stomach ailments. Heartburn is the first one here. So what heartburn is, you guys, is the backflow of chyme into the esophagus. So remember your food is getting broken down into chyme. Chyme is very acidic. The pH of your stomach is about um, one to two. So it's very, very acidic. And the stomach is well equipped to deal with the acid because it has very thick mucus, but the esophagus is not. So there is a, a sphincter here, a valve, right? It's actually just a thick band of muscle that squeezes shut. So when the stomach is mixing its food with its acids, the acid doesn't come up into the esophagus. But in heartburn, this little muscle here is a little bit more relaxed and it allows a passageway for the acids to come into the esophagus. And when the acids hit the wall of your esophagus, it causes discomfort and pain, right? And that's your, your heartburn. And the reason why it's called heartburn is because this area is very close to the heart. It's actually very, very high up on your chest it's really close to the bottom of your heart. So it feels like it's in the position of your heart, but it's actually the, the stomach and the esophagus meeting. 
Okay, GERD, letter B, is called gastroesophageal reflux disease or acid reflux, and this is just a very severe, um, very chronic heartburn. So for people who have it very frequently and it's very severe. Um, so that's GERD. And then stomach ulcers is our next um, sort of disorder here. And ulcers of the stomach is basically the lining getting, uh, so the mucus is interrupted. So the mucus that protects the lining of the stomach um, stops being made in certain areas. And um, I don't want to get too technical into it, but most of your stomach ulcers are created by a uh, bacterial infection. So the bacteria actually causes uh, inflammation in the stomach. And then your stomach, because of that inflammation, it's, um, it damages the healthy tissue and there's no more mucus. So an ulcer is an open wound. And so this bacterial infection has created an open wound in the lining of your stomach. And if it's not if there's a wound, it's not covered by mucus. And so whenever you're digesting food, that open wound is going to get contacted by the acids of your stomach and it's going to be very painful. So that's a stomach ulcer. Okay, so most commonly, the lining of the stomach is eroded underneath by a bacterial infection. I did list the bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. Uh, this damages the lining. It does not replace itself quickly, leading to acids causing pain, painful sores in the stomach. All right, and then let's look at our last uh, number four, gastric band and gastric bypass surgery. So um, for people who are uh, morbidly obese, who are running a very high risk of dying because they are so obese, there is a very drastic operation called gastric bypass that they can undertake. Um, and what you see is this, uh, this is the stomach, and then this is a stapled off region of the stomach. And then we see, uh, let me just, so the stomach here, if we follow this pink, the stomach becomes a small intestine. So where my cursor is right here, this is the beginning of the first part of the small intestine called the duodenum. So the duodenum is going to stretch, all, all of this is going to be the duodenum. Now, the duodenum, this area, is responsible for absorbing a lot of nutrients. It's very active in taking in calories. Um, and for gastric bypass surgery, they do two things. They're going to staple off the stomach. So the only food that the stomach can take in is reduced to the size of about a chicken egg. So that's this upper part here. So you can only eat a little bit at a time. And then that little bit goes into this portion of the intestine. So we're skipping or bypassing the duodenum, which is very, very good at absorbing calories. So we're skipping that part and we're connecting the rest of your intestines to this stomach. So you see how it does two things. It limits the amount of food that you take in by stapling off the rest of your stomach. So that's number one, it limits the amount of food you take in. And number two, it completely bypasses the most powerful absorbing part of your intestines, your small intestines, and it bypasses that. So it takes the rest of your intestines and hooks it up here. So. Uh, that's gastric bypass surgery. So it's a drastic reduction in calories, okay? Only for people who are really, really morbidly obese is the last result. Okay. Now we are on to the topic of the small intestine. So the small intestine is an area for two major things, chemical digestion and absorption of nutrients. So the, the lining, so you see the intestine's been opened up. Um, and we can see the wall of the intestines here. So all of these uh, cells that line the intestines will actually secrete enzymes and the enzymes will eat away at the food that comes into the intestines. And then it will absorb the nutrients. So you can see the arrows here is the absorption pathway, right? So this is gonna be the top. This is gonna be the empty part of your intestines. So this, the, the um, hollow region of your intestines is called the lumen. This is, for those of you who are taking anatomy later, uh, the lumen is the hollow region. And then, uh, so you're seeing that the, the nutrients will go through uh, the, the cell and then from the cell go into the bloodstream so it can travel to other cells. Um, yeah, so this is a major organ for chemical digestion and absorption of nutrients. And then in this area, we're going to mix with something called pancreatic juice and also bile. 
Um, before we talk about pancreatic juice and bile, I want to just look at number three, um, the features of the small intestine since we're looking at the picture here. So the small intestine increases its surface area. It has a lot of features that help it to have more surface to contact more of that food so you can um, both digest and also absorb more of it. So I want you to look at um, on number three, features of the small intestine. Number two, number three, and number four are all of these features. So the circular folds, you see how there's a bump you know, it's kind of like a, a, a big hill here. It goes down, and here's another raised part of your wall. Those are called circular folds. So if you look at it over here, right, there's a bump, it goes down, another bump, another bump, another bump, another bump. So those are circular folds. Those help to increase surface area of your small intestine. Then on your circular folds, you see how we cut it away. You see these little finger-like projections that come off of that circular fold? Those are called villi and those also help to increase surface area. And then on the very, very tips of these villi, there are cells, which is what this looks like, with microvilli. So these tiny projections of the cells themselves, we talked about this earlier in the semester, those also increase surface area for absorption. Okay, so circular folds, the villi, and the microvilli are all structures that increase surface area. You also have smooth muscle in the walls, going back to number one, because the smooth, the small intestine will move food through. So here, these two guys, those are the, sm the smooth muscle in the wall of your intestines. The, um, so let's go back and look at, uh, so this is a nice picture of the villi. So this is your large, this whole thing that looks like, I don't know, um, I don't know what that looks like. It looks like a villus. <laughs> But it is, uh, that's a villus, and then you can see how the in individual cells line that villus, and then the hairy little tiny projections, those are the microvilli. And then you can see that inside of a villus, you have your blood supply, and you have something called a lymphatic vessel, and those are going to absorb the nutrients for you. So you have your blood supply to bring it to other areas of the body, and the lymphatic vessel here also um, aids in absorbing nutrients. All right, so let's take a look at this picture and take a look at um, what comes into the small intestine. So here's our chyme, here's our stomach, right? So this guy here, this is gonna be the stomach. The chyme comes into the first part of our small intestine, right? So this is the duodenum, the duodenum of the small intestine. Now, what else do you see coming in here? There's a little tube here. So the pancreas, right? So this blank, this organ is the pancreas. The pancreas makes something called pancreatic juice, and the pancreatic juice has enzymes that dissolves, that digest all of the food groups. It will secrete its pancreatic juice into this route. And then the liver, so this big um, brown organ is called the liver, right, so that's liver. And then uh, there's another little organ underneath the liver called the gallbladder. So this is gallbladder. They, so the, the liver makes bile, but the gallbladder stores the bile. Either way, bile is coming from both the liver and the gallbladder traveling down this way. And both the bile and the pancreatic juice mix with that uh, chyme coming in from the stomach. So at this point, we don't call it chyme anymore when it comes in the small intestine, but that's what it's called when it comes in, right? So it mixes all together and it helps with, um, it helps with digestion. So, um, when we get to uh, the accessory organs, I'll go into a little bit more what the pancreatic juice contains and what bile contains, but for now, we'll just leave it there. And then let's talk about, so what comes next? Concept check. Pharynx, then the esophagus, then the stomach, and then what? So your answer should be A, the duodenum, right? So if you look at your outline, there's three segments of the small intestine. There's the first part, which I talked about already, is called the duodenum. It's only about 10 inches long, but it's really, really uh, important for absorbing nutrients. The second part of the small intestine is called the jejunum, and the third part is called the ileum. Okay, so when we take a look at the small intestines, it's impossible to see from the outside where the duodenum ends and where the jejunum begins or where the ileum begins, but um, you can see that the, the size of it, it's very, very long, very coiled uh, organ. Um, it's called small because the diameter is small. It's very, actually much longer than your large intestine. 
Um, when we are, so we're coming here into our large intestine, but just before that, your notes talk about the microbiome. So in your gut, in the small intestine and also in the large intestine, now that we're talking about intestines, you have uh, about three pounds of bacteria. And these bacteria are just normal, healthy parts of our um, gut, what we call the gut flora. And uh, that's called the microbiome. And there is a lot of interaction between the microbiome and our cells. And so this is a really huge area of research right now. P uh, scientists are looking into um, the differences in people's microbiome and how that might contribute to things like weight gain or weight loss, um, inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease or irritable, irritable bowel disease, um, or I think it's irritable bowel syndrome, um, IBS, uh, and you know a myriad of different things, even things like depression or um, cancer. Uh, they're looking at how the microbiome can um, be different uh, or like what the microbiome does and how it affects these disease outcomes or health outcomes of, of people. So it's a very big area of research. Anyways, that's my little two cents on the microbiome. Um, so let's talk about the large intestine now. So we have the nutrient flow right? So the small intestine, again, the job of the small intestine is to absorb nutrients and to break things down. So by the time we reach the large intestine, everything that has been absorbed has been absorbed, okay? So we're done absorbing. The substances that come into the large intestine is basically waste, and the large intestine's job is to absorb the extra water so all the water that comes in with the waste, we want that back because if we didn't get that back, we'd dehydrate. So it absorbs the water and it also compacts it into feces so we, are, uh, we can get rid of it or eliminate it easier, okay? So let's take a look at our large intestine. It's about five feet long. Again, number one has smooth muscle for peristalsis. Uh, digestion and absorption is largely done, right? So that's the small intestine's job. Now, the beginning of your large intestine, um, this region here, there is an appendix, right? And where this appendix is on your body is the lower right-hand side. So kind of just a little bit above your right hip, you're gonna have your appendix. And so that area, if you have a lot of pain there and, and also fever, uh, that's a bad sign. <laughs> that might be appendicitis. So, um, but that's where your appendix is. And the appendix, is thought to be a vestigial organ where in the past, perhaps this organ was bigger and had more of a role in the body. Right now they're kind of scratching their heads and they don't really know if it's active right now, if it plays a big role in our health. Um, some people think that it's, um, it stores your healthy bacteria so that if you have diarrhea or if you have some kind of illness that the bacteria here can come out and repopulate. Anyways, the appendix, it, it can get infected because you can see there's a little hole here. So the waste coming in can actually get inside the appendix and um, create an infection, which is what appendicitis is. All right. So the functions of the large intestine are to absorb water from your alimentary canal. It produces and it stores your feces until it's ready to be eliminated. Okay. When your large intestine is irritated, so it can cause the paracelsis to speed up. The water is not adequately absorbed. So if you're moving things through quickly, you're not gonna give it time to absorb the water and then the waste that comes out will be very watery, which is what we call diarrhea, right? So if you uh, ate something bad, right? If you had um, food with, that had sat out for a long time and the bacteria made a toxin or the ba it was basically a lot of bacteria, your intestine doesn't like that, and so it'll just push it through really quickly so that you have diarrhea. On the other hand, um, constipation is an ex, it's sort of like the waste is moving through really slowly, so your intestines slow down, meaning that smooth muscle and peristalsis slows down. And um, the food, or you know, not the food now, it's waste, has extra time in your large intestine, and there's extra water absorption to the point where your feces is very, very hard and it can make elimination very difficult. Um, so that's called constipation. Okay, so two, uh, two things to think about with your large intestine. If it's not moving uh, at the correct speed, right, you can get diarrhea or you can have constipation. 
Um, the last portion of your, of your large intestine is called the rectum, and then the uh, last, very last portion is called the anus. The anus will have these circular muscles here called sphincter muscles, and they, you can control these, right? If you have to go to the bathroom and you don't want to, or you have to find a bathroom, uh, then you can squeeze this muscle and it holds your waist in so you don't sort of um, accidentally go to the bathroom. Um, just so you guys know, when you have waste in your in large intestines, it's stored here. This part of your large intestine is called the sigmoid colon, and so the waste is here. It's not in your rectum. So the rectum will only receive the um, feces when you're actively going to the bathroom. All right, so this is a good overview of the digestive system. Our mouth is for ingesting the food. We have mechanical digestion and chemical digestion listed for you. Um, here and then we have absorption so this is color coded right so we have our yellow digestion happening absorption is part of your small intestine large intestine is absorbing just water okay nutrients and water in the small intestine and then water just water in the large intestine and then elimination this is another nice flow chart that you can look at in terms of what the, the canal is made of, right? So our mouth all the way to the anus is one long tube and it just has different structures along that tube. We have accessory organs. So accessory organs are organs that are not part of that tube, but they can secrete substances into it. So our salivary glands secrete saliva into our mouth, right? And then our liver, gallbladder, and pancreas secrete into that small intestine. This shows you where you have the different kinds of digestion going on. Mechanically, the stomach as it churns the food is also a kind of mechanical digestion. And then the chemical uh, digestion is, again, mainly enzymes, but you do have acid um, and then other enzymes. So we have enzyme, acid and enzyme, enzyme. And then absorption occurs in the small intestine and large intestine, but again, the large intestine is just water. Okay, if you had your gallbladder removed, what might be the most logical outcome? Pause this, think about it, and it would be B. Uh, you would have trouble digesting lipids. And I think that we haven't really gotten to this yet, uh, so I should probably move this question because I haven't talked about bile. But bile, which is what the gallbladder creates, um, will help you digest fats or lipids. Most nutrient absorption occurs where? Um, so I'll give you the answer. It's letter D. The small intestine. All right, and then um, the oh, wait, pause here. Let's pause this and start with um, part two in a second.